Hi everyone, my name is Emer Maguire and welcome to my faculty lecture as part of the Out to Lunch Festival. I want to say a really, really big thank you to Out to Lunch and also to Seedhead Arts for having me. And also just a really big thank you to them for generally keeping arts alive at this really, really weird time. So to everybody watching, thanks for joining me for a little bit of midweek crack with a little sprinkling of science. Today I wanted to have a look at laughter. I wanted to explore the ins and outs of laughter because I just find it absolutely fascinating and I'm hoping by the end of this little talk that you will find it fascinating as well. There's so many questions that come into my head whenever I think about laughter. Why do we laugh? Why do all of us find different things funny? Why is my favourite comedian different than your favourite comedian? Is there almost like a recipe for a good joke? And are comedians born and not made? Is it something you can learn? I also always think, you know, does humour affect us in ways other than laughter? Does it affect our health? And does laughter maybe even make us live longer? And I know it probably feels at this really uncertain time that we don't have that much to be happy about. But something that I'm trying to do and I've been trying to do, to just to even try and keep people smiling and laughing and cheer them up a little bit, is just to talk a little bit about things like laughter, kind of try and get some positive vibes out there and also just play a little bit of musical comedy. It makes me feel better and I hope that it makes others feel better too. The reason that I have this really, really keen interest in laughter is because I am a musical comedian. I want to make people laugh. I love making people laugh. There's nothing better than being at a gig and hearing, hearing an audience laugh at your jokes. Uh, but why that kind of scientific side to it? I'm also a science communicator. I have a real interest in science. I'm really interested in how humans work and why we do the things that we do and why we behave the way that we do. So I communicate science to the public, hopefully to make it more enjoyable and also more engaging. So I thought I would mix those two things up. And today I thought we could have a little bit of a chat about what makes things funny how are they funny and also sing you a couple of my comedy songs to demonstrate some of my points and theories about laughter. So as I'm sure most of you know you can't really make comedy into like a formula because some people are just funny. Think about your friendship groups there's always a really really hilarious person in the group. Think about your mates the ones that make you double over laughing. Some people are just good crack and some people just aren't so <laughs> if you're thinking that there's nobody in my friendship group that's not absolute banter it's probably you uh, so while there is science to it I don't want you to think that I think it's necessarily really formulaic or something that you can just entirely learn but I have a few questions today that I want to go through and I want to answer with all of you that will hopefully demystify the science of laughter and I thought we could start with the title of my talk. So I've called this talk, Laughter's the Best Medicine. You know, is that, is that really true? Is there any truth to the phrase? Is it actually good for you? So this is an interesting question because people used to think that that was a bit of an old wives tale. Uh, my mom's favorite thing to say <laughs> whenever me or my siblings uh, would hurt ourselves when we were young, when we were kids was, good laugh, you'd be grand. Um, that was kind of her version. I think of laughter as the best medicine. I'm not saying my mom's a great philosopher or anything, but it turns out that that's pretty true. Uh, you could have fallen down the stairs and broken every bone in your body and the paramedics would be carrying you out and she'd be shouting, good laugh, you'd be grand, you know, full body cast. Uh, but it turns out there is truth to it. There was something behind it. Studies have shown that laughter creates more antibody producing cells, which is Great, something that we all need at the minute, leading to stronger uh, immune responses and a stronger immune system. It also lowers your stress hormone, cortisol, which makes you feel more relaxed. Think about it, you know, if you're watching your favorite comedy TV show, I'm sure you're feeling pretty, pretty chill. I was gonna say, if you're, at a, if you're at a comedy show, you'd be feeling quite relaxed, but I know when I go, I'm always quite nervous the comedian's gonna pick on me, so that's not a good comparison. Um, laughter even releases endorphins, and people usually associate endorphins with things like sport or working out. Laughter releases them too, and it can actually ease real physical pain. 
I think the most interesting healthy side effect of laughter that I have come across is the fact that it is good for your heart. Uh, there was a study by a researcher called Dr. Miller that showed laughing actually makes your arteries more flexible. And I just think that's unbelievable. You know, you're cracking yourself up with your mates, you're making your arteries more flexible. The reason that's important is because that slows down the aging process of your arteries and it means you're less likely to have things like a stroke or a heart attack. And there was another study that showed that people who have heart disease are 40% less likely to laugh than people the same age without heart disease. So basically I'm hoping I ain't gonna live forever. Uh, and it turns out laughter is the best medicine is, is truer than you think. There are other positives. Other studies show that it can be good for the brain. It can enhance your cognitive functioning. Uh, isn't that crazy? It can also increase your friendliness. It can make you appear more friendly to others. So it's healthy, it's friendly, and you've got a brighter brain. Sounds pretty good to me. And I should probably play one of my comedy tunes now to see if there's a positive impact on those of you who are listening. And funnily enough, music can also impact us positively. It can have loads of the same effects as comedy. It can also imp improve your blood pressure. Uh, it can improve your general well-being, uh, lower stress, the same as comedy, and it also helps things like sleep disorders, anxiety, and depression. So I feel like musical comedy is a little bit of a winning combination. So to start off and see if I can make everyone a little bit more chilled out, less stressed, feeling happier, healthier and brighter, I'm going to play one of my songs. I'm going to start with a song that tells you a lot about me because this is the first song. Um, and I feel like it's good to get a little bit of an introduction to whoever's giving you a little bit of a talk. And it's a song that tells you all that you need to know about me. Um, and it's a song about the trials and tribulations that I've suffered as a result of being a middle child. Um, any fellow middle children out there, I, I hear you. It's a very, very difficult place to be. <laughs> um, you can kind of, if you're not sure if you're a middle child or if you're not sure if any of your friends are a middle child or if you've met one in the wild, it's the people with the kind of look of pain and devastation behind the eyes. That's how you spot them. Um, and there's so, many, there's so many things that are associated with being a middle child. I mean, usually people see the negatives so I, I decided to try and look for the positives of being a middle child. And there was a study that said if you're a middle child, you're more likely to be socially strong, socially stronger than your siblings, i.e. the most, most popular. Um, and the reason for that is because obviously as a middle child, you're kind of the peacemaker. You need to learn to be able to no negotiate and people please and build bridges. And another study said, my favorite study so far, that uh, middle children, are actually more likely to have a flourishing career, which I thought was pretty cool. And I have to say flourishing is um, not the F word that my dad used when I said I was gonna be a full-time comedian, but there you have it. So this song that I have written is kind of an ode to all the middle children out there. If every time your mother smiled around you, you both knew she was thinking about the other two. You know that you're the middle child. If when your family all played hide and seek, it was a week before they noticed you were gone at all. You know that you're the middle child. If every time your dad called your name, Without shame, you'd say Catherine, Mary, Connor, Sean, Sarah, Susan, Kara, John, Mary, Joseph, Toto, Ben. What's your name again? Middle children, full of crippling self-doubt and jealous rage. Middle children, unfairly disliked because of birth, order and age. And we'll never understand why we're vilified. Until we have our own kids and we hate our own middle child. You know that you're the middle child If any time you ever cried Your mom took you aside and said I'll give you something to cry about Even though you'd broken both your legs Your parents didn't really care That they brought your sister to a and &E When she got chewing gum in her hair You know that you're the middle child If you showed your parents this song And they both laughed along 
told you that it wasn't wrong. Middle children full of crippling self-doubt and jealous rage. Middle children unfairly disliked because of birth order and age. And we'll never understand why we're vilified. Until we have our own kids and we hit our own middle child. Hope everybody's feeling absolutely smarter after that, friendlier, healthier, great. Uh, so basically laughter is amazing for your health. So are there any downsides to it? I know sometimes we can be a little bit negative and look for the downsides and you could think, no downsides to laughter whatsoever, 100% positive, but there is one downside and it is the fact that laughing can actually kill you. Uh, people have died of laughter in real life. And when I heard that, I was a little bit mind blown. But in Denmark, in the 1980s, a man, shouldn't laugh, a man laughed so much while watching the movie, A Fish Called Wanda. I mean, is that a funny movie? I haven't even seen that. That he had a heart attack and died, understandable. But also, in 1975, a man in England died laughing while watching an episode of the TV show called The Goodies. Um, he laughed continuously for 25 minutes. No TV show was that funny. Constantly, continuously, and then died of heart failure, which you'd think is quite a depressing statistic, but there is a little bit of an upside to the story. So his widow, after his death, sent the TV show a letter to say, thank you so much for making my husband's last moments of life so, so, so happy. And I kind of think if you got to choose a way to go I think death by laughter would be a pretty good choice. Kind of gives new meaning to that whole way that people love to say, nearly died laughing, nearly died laughing, she's hilarious, nearly died laughing. Um, dead, or the, the more millennial is just we deceased. And if someone ever kind of drops dead at one of my shows, which is quite a morbid thing to say, but I am very quickly going to claim that they died of laughter now that I know that it's an actual thing. So what is the main function of laughter? Why, as humans, do we laugh? Now, the main reason for it is social. So it's all about social bonding and communication, like so many things that humans do. And if you think about it, there are so many different types of laughter, and they all have different meanings. You know, you've got, you've got your, your happy laughter, <laughs> um, which is a terrible example of happy laughter. It sounded quite creepy. You've got your, your evil, evil laughter. You've got awkward laughter, nervous laughter. And the type of laugh that you do serves as a communicative tool to the person that you're directing it towards. And whenever you ask people why they laugh, the majority of people say, oh, I laugh because someone told me a joke. I, I laugh in response to jokes, but we're way more likely to laugh for other reasons, like to show someone that we like them, to show someone that we want to keep talking to them. Even if you think about um, other, other other animals and things, they communicate in a way that is geared towards social bonding to communicate with other animals how they feel about them. We do the same thing. Like, I'm a comedian. Um, yes, we're, yes, uh, less use of the, the word comedian, but I don't tell jokes. I don't make up jokes. I just tell stories, which is maybe more of a, a Northern Ireland style of comedy, but it's, so it's not all about kind of those classic corny jokes. It's more about human experience, storytelling, conversation, and social bonding. So laughing is a really, really social activity. And being with someone makes us so much more likely to laugh than if we were on our own. So say, for example, you're watching an episode of Friends, which I've been doing constantly during lockdown. Uh, you're, you're by yourself, and you might find it hilarious, really, really funny. But it's very unlikely that you will laugh. So I want you to think about last time you watched something alone that you thought was hilarious. Really unlikely you'll laugh when you're alone, no matter how funny it is. Um, I don't even crack a smile if I'm watching Friends and I think it's hilarious. Or, you know, I, I don't even smile, but in my head I'm thinking, this is great. Um, but if you're watching it with a couple of other people, chances are you will laugh at every joke. You'll be laughing, you'll be looking at them, you'll be enjoying it as a social activity. 
And do you remember those kind of laugh tracks that the, the sitcoms used to use? Some of them still do. That weird laughter that sounded suspiciously similar every time. Whenever that was invented back in 1950, it was to make the audience feel more comfortable watching TV because it was like a relatively new medium. And the canned laughter served to kind of replicate some kind of social, comfortable experience. And the parts of our brain that are responsible for laughter are the really animalistic parts of the brain that we have. And they're also responsible for some of our most involuntary and basic behaviors and functions, which kind of means that laughter is just as much of an instinct for us as humans as things like eating or breathing. So one thing that comedians worry about and think about is the phenomenon of jokes falling flat. So why do some jokes fall flat? Why do different things uh, be found funny by different people? So the really, really big factor that this depends on is context. So if people understand the context, they're so much more likely to laugh, even if they don't find the joke funny. If you tell like a really, really niche joke or a joke that isolates some members of the audience, you're not gonna get the laugh that you are expecting. For example, I'm very interested in politics. If you were to tell me a political joke of which there are many in our country, I would probably laugh regardless because even if I don't find it that funny, I understand the context and I want to communicate to you that I understand the context and that we've got something in common and I'm interested in the topic just like you. Whereas if I told that joke to my brother who hates politics, he wouldn't laugh. Uh, even if he understood the joke, he's unlikely to laugh because it would encourage me to keep talking about it. It would encourage me to think this is a topic we have in common. Um, and there was kind of an example of this a few years ago. So myself and my brother were, we were actually watching like a rerun of one of the political party scenes in Saturday Night Live. And I thought this was the funniest thing I'd ever laughed. I thought it was hilarious. Um, every, every comment, every line, I thought it was great. He hated it so much. Um, Kev asked me, turned over, put on Keep It Up with the Kardashians, and it really showed me that context can be everything in getting a laugh. Um, and it also showed me, obviously, that my brother has very questionable taste, but mainly the thing about the context. And at the minute, we are all in the context of being in a shared experience, in a similar situation with the pandemic and with lockdown. Um, and because of that, what I have done is I have written some songs that are relevant to the shared experience that we're having because everybody understands the, con the context at the minute. And one of the songs that I've written, which should be contextual to everyone, is, well, the majority of people, is about working from home during the pandemic. So this song hopefully will show you that context is everything. Even if you don't work from home at the minute, you'll be understanding the jokes about how annoying Zoom can be and being stuck in the house with the family and things like that. So this song that I wrote, I kind of wrote it by thinking about all the things that had happened, all the things that I experienced that other people will experience at the same time and things that will be relatable in that context. So, you know, trying to work, but watching Netflix instead, Zoom calling my bosses with a shirt on top of my PJs, noticing that my partner breathes incredibly loud while we're working side by side and wondering how I've never never quite noticed that before, uh, those kind of things. So I thought I would write a song to kind of channel that work at home, working from home kind of rage, you know, those memories. Working from home, feeling alone, kids are screaming 9 a.m. already. Time for your first meeting is wearing pajamas. Still a no-no, wanna throw your laptop out the window. Your boss is understanding, tells you just to do your best. They know that you're stressed. They still want your work on their virtual desk. Homeschooling, who am I fooling? I don't even understand. This is a global pandemic. Do we really need Pythagoras? Times tables, famous fables, eight by four is 17. Teachers need a metal All I have is gin and caffeine. The only thing my kid will learn during homeschool time is that he's smarter than me. And I've got two degrees, and he's eight. Working from home, feeling alone. Kids are screaming 10 a.m. already. Time for your next Zoom meeting is a shower. Still essential, I wonder is my crisis. Existential, dog growling, you're scrolling, can't get any peace and quiet. Might as well head to the fridge for your indulgent lockdown diet, which basically consists of 
delicious snacks every hour on the hour, but the grand scheme of things, <laughs> what's a few tons of chocolate? Sure, there's a pandemic. I really love dairy milk. Working from home, feeling alone. Kids are screaming 1 p.m. already. Time for your next meeting. How is Santa's living room nicer than mine? Hang on, Stevie, you drinking a glass of wine? The camera angle is unflattering at best. Why's everyone dressed? While I'm late to my desk. Well, kitchen table. Working from home, feeling alone. Kids are screaming 2 p.m. already. Time for your next Zoom meeting. So many things I cannot comprehend. Like the fact the dishwasher is full again. <laughs> Do we always eat this much? What just use a wee paper plate for your lunch there? What is chicken curry? No, you can't use a paper plate for that, no. Eat it from your hands. P.E. with Joe, how about? No, I don't want to sweat around my living room or do yoga via Zoom making sourdough. Ugh, oh, why though? You should be working, but instead I'm burning banana bread. You miss your colleagues, you miss your office, they miss you. But when this is through, we'll all have the maddest staff do. But until then, Microsoft Teams quarantine dreams. All these apps that are new to me. Another night on house party, lockdown lingo, online bingo. Dodgy haircut, DIY, it's good you have to stay inside. Even if we're all just working through a screen, you're still a team, smashing it through quarantine. Working from home, but you're not alone. Let's try keep each other's spirits high. See you on the other side. So that is an example of one of the songs that you kind of think the majority of people will understand the context, and because they understand the context, they'll find some of the things within it pretty funny. So are there theories of why we find certain things funny in the way that there are other theories in psychology and science? There are loads, and two of my favourite are the following as to why we find a few weird and wonderful things funny. So one theory says that we find things funny if they're incongruent or absurd, like if something doesn't really quite fit right in our heads, like if you can't make sense of it for a brief second, that can make us laugh. Say for example, you do something really silly in front of a toddler and they laugh their heads off for ages. Something that they, they can't really make sense of for a second, like, like peekaboo, where have you gone? Oh, you're back, where have you gone? It's, it's a little bit silly. It interrupts what they think should happen and that is incongruent. And there's a really, really well-known joke that's a good example of this. So two goldfish are in a tank and one turns to the other and says, here, Jim, do you have any idea how to drive this thing? Now, originally you picture a fish tank with a couple of fish swimming about. Then you get this image of two goldfish in a proper big tank vehicle. Like, how weird would that be? And there's some kind of level of letting our brain catch up with the absurdity of that. It's not the most hilarious joke in the world, but it's perfect for explaining how jokes that kind of slightly cleverly defy our expectation can get a bit of a smile or a laugh. There's another theory that looks at kind of humour in the, the sense of how it makes us feel. And there are a few well-known philosophers like Aristotle, Descartes and um, Plato, the, the great thinker that the Plato used to play with when you're wee. And those guys kind of think that we feel, we feel good about humour if we feel superior to others. Um, and it sounds a bit silly at first, to be honest, but think about it. Don't we all kind of find it funny when there's a show where a character is the, the butt of the joke. And there's always that character. If you think Friends, it's, it's Joey, Modern Family, it's, it's Phil. Um, like how hilarious is anything said by Father Dougal Maguire, no relation, and uh, Father Ted. And he's famously silly, but um, I mean, I'm pretty sure the philosophers weren't big Father Ted fans, but he gets a laugh because we feel superior to him. Um, and, and that sense of superiority is what those philosophers thought made us laugh. Now think about it the other way around. Do you ever find it highly amusing when you are the butt of the joke? You find it actually quite irritating and embarrassing. And that's because you feel inferior. This only works if you feel superior. And in Northern Ireland, we can be very self-deprecating in our humour. Um, and that really works because it makes our conversation partner 
feel superior and therefore more likely to, to say, to find what you're saying funny. And I want to play you one of my songs where the entire song is an over-characterization of me being a socially awkward person. Um, with very, very self-deprecating lines, line after line, listing all my socially awkward flaws. And the listener subconsciously, as the song goes on, feels more and more superior to me. Um, so this is a song called Socially Awkward, about some of the awkward situations I found myself in, in my life. Uh, this is part one of 37, so please listen to this and, and feel superior with, with every line. I'm socially awkward, it's like my brain is sick My normalness gets blurred when I'm out in public I giggle at funerals, think that it's okay to Just smile and nod even though I cannot hear you Please don't ask me a question and Cause I have got no idea what we're talking about Oh, oh one time I walked into a shop, didn't have what I needed in stock But now I can't leave without buying anything That would only look suspicious, is my paranoia fictitious? I don't care, I spend a fortune on things I don't need I buy some milk and I'm lactose intolerant I'm gluten free and I bought seven loaves of wheat and bread I bought some cigarettes, I don't even know how to smoke I should have walked out of the shop instead I'm socially awkward, it's like my brain is sick My normalness gets blurred when I'm out in public I get I giggle at funerals, stiffen when you praise me Think it's okay to say your ma seems why lazy If she's really lazy Why would I say she's not? She seems pretty lazy So now I'm trying to leave my work But up ahead I see some jerk Smiling and holding the door for me I alternate between run and walk I hope he doesn't try to talk This weird shuffle's making it look like I need to pee But I just say thanks He holds open another door I say thanks again and then think Oh no, I've been trapped here before If we don't break the cycle, this will never end So I jump out the nearest window Thanks a lot, my friend, I'm socially awkward It's like my brain is sick My normalness gets blurred when I'm out in public I giggle at funerals Stiffen when you hug me Think it's okay to say but baby's ugly if it's really ugly Why would I say he's cute? It's clearly ugly I'm socially awkward So throughout that song you should feel pretty superior to myself Obviously being a very, very flawed individual um, So something that people ask me is, you know are humans the only ones that laugh? Do animals laugh as well? And laughter does seem like such a human trait, but several other animals do have laughter-like vocalizations, which I just think is amazing. It's so, so interesting. And apes like chimps and gorillas laugh whenever, whenever they're tickled or when they play. Um, it's found more recently, actually, they laugh in response to other chimps laugh as well. But it sounds a little bit more, you know, a little bit more like screeching than human laughter. And before we evolved to have speech, our laughter probably sounded like screeching as well. Like, I'm sure you know a couple of people whose laughter still sounds like screeching. Um, and the fact that most of the animals that laugh are apes imply that laughter was kind of a feature that was present in the ancestor that was common to both chimps and humans, meaning that laughter possibly evolved before humans did. So, that just blows my mind. I just think that's the coolest thing ever. Um, and a more surprising animal that has been shown to have some laughter like sounds is the rat. Uh, there was this study where some very brave and, and probably insane humans had to tickle rats to see their rat reactions. And the rats went mad for it, absolutely loved it, loved a good tickle. And the tickling made them laugh. And that's, to me, that's kind of the stuff of night. I don't know why you would apply for that post of rat tickler. I just think that's bizarre. Um, but, but that's the stuff nightmares are, are made of, you know, laughing rats. And could you just imagine what, what person thought, here, lads, today I'm going to tickle a rat. Um, so laughter seems to be more of a basic animalistic trait than you would think. 
And I suppose as, as a comedian, you kind of think, is there, like, is there the perfect formula for a joke? What makes things funny, you know? Is there a formula of sorts? What's the perfect joke, the perfect comedian? And as I did say earlier, context is key. Like if you know your 83 year old granny isn't into Harry Potter, you're not gonna tell her a joke using words like Quidditch and Hufflepuff, she'll be incredibly confused and, and certainly won't laugh. But the next most important thing that creates a good joke is unexpected logic. People will find something funny if you start talking about something normally and then take an unexpected but still logical turn for example, whenever I moved into my current house in Belfast, um, my dad came up to see my new place and I was expecting him to say something along the lines of, well, I suppose you've the place looking well, or it's good size, or good location, something like that. Don't know why, that's never the script the parents go with when you get something new or move into a new house. But instead of all the things he could have commented on, my dad came downstairs after his little inspection of the house. Um, and said, here, I was looking down your new toilet, and I like the look of that toilet freshener that you have. And I burst out laughing because I thought, firstly, there's something really wrong with, with my father. And also because he had just completely detoured from what I had expected him to say, but it still made sense somewhat in the context that it was still relevant to my new house. And the brain is surprised by that. It's, it's surprised by a conversation that doesn't go where you expect, but it still fits because it kind of, it creates this kind of jarring dissonance uh, and that makes us laugh. We laugh as a result. So if you want to be funny, say something unexpected that can still fit into the context that you are in. Now surprising the brain with a punchline of a joke is good, but it can work against you as well if you, if you overdo it. So we're very smart. And if we hear a joke once, our brain really quickly learns the pattern of the joke and the pattern of the punchline. So if you hear that joke again, you hear it again, a second time, third time, you don't find it as funny because your brain gets bored. It's, it's learned that pattern, it needs something new to, to tickle it. Uh, and timing as well, you know, you always hear about comic timing, but comic timing was fantastic. Timing is really key in being funny, and if you're taking an unexpected turn in the hope of being funny, you need to get your timing right with the turn. If you say the punchline too early, your brain doesn't have enough time to figure out the, the process or the setup of the joke. But if you say the punchline too late and your brain figures out the punchline before you get to it, it's a massive disappointment. Your joke needs to fall somewhere in the middle to get a laugh. And that's what people, scientifically, that's what people mean whenever they talk about comic timing. And one song that, that I've written that has a real emphasis on saying things that are unexpected but still fit entirely within the context is, is the song I'm gonna play you next. It also has a bit of an emphasis on timing because it's a very fast paced song and the punchlines fall just at the time where people don't expect the upcoming pun, haven't figured it out ahead of time, but they get, they get the joke quickly enough for it to be funny. So for, to give you a bit of context with context uh, being the word of the day and everything being funnier with context, this song that I have written was almost like an ode to my sister. So it, it basically is, is a textbook version of things not going where you expect, but they still make sense. So my sister is uh, a software developer, um, sorry, senior software developer. And uh, she kind of, our relationship consists of me ringing her up to, to ask for IT advice and her being absolutely, you know, no help whatsoever. Um, and like all good IT people. And she kind of talks to me like I've never seen a computer in my life. And, you know, like I'm a millennial, like I, I probably came out of the, the womb holding an iPad. So I, I think that's a very, very strange tack to take. And I, as a result of that, have started to respond to her. Like I have no clue what she's talking about. Um, and I respond to her in puns only. So puns are kind of a good example of unexpected turns, which still fit the context. And this song is kind of chock full of them. So this is Computer Guru. Sitting at my desk, I'm feeling so bereft Right in front of me was the blue screen of death I call up my sister, she'll know what to do A software engineer, a computer guru, guru Now I say guru, but I say that very lightly Because despite her qualifications, she never gets it right See, all she does is ask a ton of questions through a muffled jaw And then says, 
Mm. I don't know, Weimer, have you tried turning it off and on? Actually, I never thought of that, said no one ever. And I know the UIT folk are very, very clever, but my sister likes to ask me that stuff every single time. Is it on at the plug? Is your router online? And so I called her up to help me with my latest problem, my blue screen of death issues, to see if she could solve them. I prepared myself then for her onslaught of questions, computer genius language, and technical suggestions. These are actual conversations that we have had. She asked me, is your monitor working? What happens when you print? Have you cleared your cache? I said, I have indeed, I'm skint. Is your router working? Is the signal being carried? Is your Wi-Fi turned on? I said, she know I'm not married. She asked, how are my cookies? I said, they're pretty sweet. A wee bit too good if you ask me. Calorific, but hard to beat. She asked if I had a certificate to validate by sight. I said, just one for swimming 200 meters in 1999. Tell me what to do, my computer guru. Did I receive malicious emails? Any to announce? Well, I did get a few wee bitchy ones there from Deborah in accounts. But what about my data? Was it all in a hard drive? When I say it's on my desktop, she acts like I'm deprived. Do I have enough memory? As far as I recall. Do I have enough RAM? No, I'm not in the sheep at all. Do I have an antivirus? Did I use protection? I said the doctor said that there were no signs of infection. Tell me what to do, my computer guru. And suddenly a light bulb goes, total realization. Of course she knows the fix. She's a computing sensation. She turns to me with tears filling up her eyes. I don't need to say it. She knows she's so wise. She looks at me and says, there is just one thing left to do. And if this doesn't work, I'm no computer guru. Now I'm out on a limb here, and we're just thinking on my feet, but try and see if this works. Control, Alt, Delete. So that is my kind of example of a song that kind of defies your expectations but totally fulfills the context and the criteria of a, a similar joke. So the last question I wanted to ask was why do some people laugh at inappropriate times like at funerals or when someone is upset? And people ask this quite a lot because it's something people get embarrassed by and they think that they're the only ones who, who do it who laugh at inappropriate times, but it's really, really common. Um, I remember in primary school, I was at a sleepover <laughs> and the movie of choice was Bambi. And I had never seen Bambi before, but it might as well have been Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, and that part where Bambi's mother is, hashtag spoiler alert, is shot and killed, bit graphic for kids, uh, by a hunter. I started laughing hysterically out of pure, pure discomfort. Um, and I honestly, I could not stop could not cope with it. Um, and my classmate's mom made me leave the room. I, I am pretty sure she thought I was a psychopath. Like she has had me pegged from seven years old as an absolute nut job. But the reason I was laughing at such an inappropriate thing was because Bambi's mother, Diane, was so upsetting, if you have a heart. And I was in a room with about 10 other seven-year-olds who were crying their eyes out. And my brain did not know how to cut. I'd never been in that situation before. I was so overwhelmed. Um, and the, the ordeal made me feel really stressed. And laughing helps reduce the levels of stress hormone cortisol. So I can only imagine I was trying to calm myself down and kind of promote those feel-good hormones and chemicals within my brain to help me cope in difficult situations. And that is why people laugh at uncomfortable situations. So if you're in a situation like that, like a funeral, uh, or like if you've just witnessed a, a cartoon character die, your brain can realise that laughter is a good way to try and cope with the stress that you're feeling. But the worst thing is, the more that you're not supposed to laugh in those situations, the more that you do. But try and frame it in, in a positive way. <laughs> so all in all, there's so many theories as to why we laugh, why we enjoy humour, how it makes us feel, what the purpose is. But we know a few things for sure. Laughter is a scientifically social experience and it makes us feel great. To end, I thought I would play us out with a feel good song that I wrote at the beginning of the very, very first lockdown, all that, all that time ago, to cheer people up. That was my sole purpose of writing this song. And it's a song to give you ideas for things to keep you occupied during however many lockdowns we're gonna have. And most importantly, it's a song that hopefully make you smile. Hopefully it might even make you laugh. Um, if you've enjoyed my stuff and my songs, I'm going to be doing a big solo show in the Ulster Hall when we're finally allowed out again. And it's going to be on the 16th of October. So 
16th of October, so please do come. I would love to see you there. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm really hoping that you keep smiling and keep laughing. And this song is Lockdown. So we're in lockdown, stuck in quarantine. I'm socially distant, but I think I've always been. So here's some ideas to keep you occupied, to keep our souls happy while we're hanging out inside. Call up your sister, tell her she's got class. FaceTime your granny, agree it's time for the capital of math. WhatsApp your brothers, check their money's doing fine. Text your dad and suggest he pours your mother a glass of wine. Organize your cupboards, find some random herbs and spices. Discover you'll still never use that turmeric in this crisis. Look down the sofa for an extra bit of cash. We'll need it when this is over and we're all out on the lash. We're in luck. Down, stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been So here's some ideas to keep you occupied To keep our souls happy while we're hanging out inside Go on and cut your friends, sure you've always wanted bangs Who cares if it goes wrong, no one will see you're ostracized Have a major Netflix binge, maybe learn to dance Eat Doritos for your dinner while you're chilling in your pants Act out scenes of movies with your dog playing the lead or pretend you're in Crufts and he'll invest and breed Or get out your playing cards, have a game of snap Maybe you don't need some toilet roll unless you're full of crap We're in lockdown, stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been So here's some ideas to keep you occupied To keep our souls happy while we're hanging out inside Try some online yoga, learn to speak for all say. Gather up your friends and have a Facebook live soiree. Open up your wardrobe and have a fashion show. Look into the mirror and tell yourself you're beautiful. Do a hundred push-ups, iron everything in sight. Eat your body weight and chocolate, tell yourself you'll be all right. Maybe make a scrapbook, learn to play the violin. What's up your football teammates while you're knocking back the gin? We're in lock. Down, stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been So here's some ideas to keep you occupied To keep our souls happy while we're hanging out inside Write a song about a virus that's trying to ruin the world Stealing hopes and lives and money but it won't keep down this Irish girl If we all just pull together, keep each other entertained Won't be long till we are out there Dancing in the rain, we're in luck down, stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been Just keep your head up, wash your hands, keep confined Stay apart to stick together, most importantly, be kind Thank you so much for listening I am Imre McGuire, thank you